In this short clip with LMPs, we are going to dive into a topic that might surprise you. The war in Ukraine and the annexation of Crimea by Russia. Trust me, it's going to be essential viewing for anyone interested in gaining a unique perspective on this complex topic. Originally, this clip was part of an interview that focused on nonverbal communication, but we decided to post it separately because of the importance and relevance of the subject. In this segment, Alan draws on his personal experience of being in Ukraine when Russia annexed Crimea and his personal acquaintance with the Russian President Vladimir Putin to offer insights that are surprisingly lucid. Now, you might know Alan for his expertise in human relationships and influence, but this little clip showcases his depth of understanding and knowledge of politically sensitive issues. So, if you're interested in gaining a different perspective on this important topic and hearing from one of the few people who can offer personal insights into Vladimir Putin's mind, then you don't want to miss out on this short but thought-provoking clip with LMPs. So another question that, uh, that I have on my, on my list here, your Russian connection, if I can call it like this, yeah? Do I interpret what I read correctly, that you actually trained Putin when he was still a, a little KGB agent? Well, I don't know as they trained. Uh, it's, it's, it's becoming a difficult conversation these days, of course, with the, yeah. with the start of the war going on. Uh, yes, when communism fell, when Gorbachev signed off the Soviet Union, uh, Barbara and I arrived in the new Russia six weeks after that. And one of our objectives was first to become experts in Russian speaking in Eastern European countries because they, communism was collapsing everywhere. and They'd never seen anything like us and we figured that this could be a, a huge market for us and exciting. And so we decided we needed somebody famous to, to be their consultant to, to give us a, a, a point of reference, for, a point of credibility. And we tried to get Boris Yeltsin, but he never turned up. He was the new, the new president. And uh, somebody said, oh, look, we know a guy who's the deputy mayor, the first, uh, the first appointed officially appointed politician in Russia was a guy called Anatoly Sobchak. And he was in St. Petersburg, the first mayor. And he, he was a progressive. They said he likes the idea of a conference to train up Russians. So we did a, a one-day seminar for how to go in the media and look credible for the, the new 300 politicians of this new country called Russia. And uh, the mayor couldn't attend the day because he had business in, in uh, Moscow. So the deputy mayor ran the conference. The deputy mayor was Vladimir Putin. And so uh, that was the connection. He came from KGB and his first political job was Deputy Mayor to Anatoly Sobchak. And that's where we first met him. And about five or six years later, Anatoly died and, uh, and Vladimir became the, the, the leader of Russia. Okay. So, and, yeah. yeah. And you just said you spent a considerable amount of time in Russia over the years. What's, what's the background story here? That's right. Collectively, it's, it adds up to two to three months a year for or well, since communism fell, which uh, is over 30 years now. And uh, we published the first book, Body Language, in Russian, and it sold a million copies a month for at least 12 months that we know of. When I say that we know of, we never got paid on any of it. It was all pirated, but it just went everywhere all over Russia. And we made a TV series which went everywhere, and that, that got me established over there and, and lecturing at the university. So I got three professorship titles and... Uh, awarded to me over a 10-year period, which was you know, quite exciting, I guess. And, and that's where the connection started, that, that Russians are, are very much like Westerners in as much as they want to be like us, the Europeans. They want to have a big home and a nice car and be able to travel and have money to do things. That's what most of them are like. Of course, with the war breaking out, that's put an end to, uh, to all that, at least for the foreseeable future. And whether it ever comes back, who knows? We don't know. Mm-hmm. And last question. So I don't want to go political, yeah, but with your, with your, over the years, you, 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 you were exposed to Russian people, yeah, to the normal people, right? And I, in, in the sense of bridge building, right? Yeah. You said it already. There is not much difference between Russians, Ukrainians, uh, Dutch, Austrians, uh, Canadians, Australians. They're the yes. same people. We, again, we are basically the same people, right? And now we are vilifying, we are vilifying again, a people, right? And the yeah. longer this war drags on, the more this is happening. And you and me, we both know how easy it is to influence masses, right? Their interests on, on, on multiple fronts, interests in maintaining this war, right? But it's, yeah. it's people, right? That's true. And the people's not only a, 
there's seven basic emotions or more than that, the same in almost every culture in the world. But so are the goals and ambitions. They all want to, uh, to do well, to make money, to have a nice home, to go on vacation, uh, to have their kids well educated. They're, they're the same things whether they're Kazakhs or Tajikistans or Moldovans or Russians or Ukraines. And Ukraines and Russians have a large degree of history where they're all related together to each other, uh, which is how Crimea was taken over because I was in Crimea during the takeover. And uh, it was a celebration. It wasn't a war. Uh, the television showed wars and fighting and bombing, and there was none of that. It was a celebration because the, they were largely first and second generation Russians who were in Crimea, who were rejoining Russia, where you would, where they said, "Well, we're going to get, uh, we're going to get retirement. We're going to get superannuation. We're going to get medical benefits. We're going to get social security, which Ukraine couldn't provide." And so, it was a happy event. It was shown to the world as a miserable event, but it wasn't because I was there. And I think when they started, when the Russians started with Kiev and with uh, Luhansk and, and Donetsk, which were historically largely Russian, they thought they'd be equally as welcomed, and it didn't happen, did it? It didn't happen for reasons we know, because it, the, the interests behind it who are not allowing this to happen. Yeah, but of course, there's one question. One question I cannot avoid asking you. Yeah, no. Analyzing, analyzing Putin. Yeah, have yes. you done it? Yes. Well, I get that question a lot these days. Um, the thing about Vladimir Putin, I found him to be uh, a fairly solid guy. Uh, he was quiet. He was like, he's definitely at the steel fist with the velvet glove. There's no doubt about that. Uh, but he was also a very compassionate guy. He is uh, a vegetarian. He believes in sports and, and he's got a black belt in at least one martial art. Uh, he, builds, he, builds uni he builds universities And, uh, and homeless shelves out of his own money. So he's got a very compassionate side with him. And he looked after my father-in-law there who was lost at the Winter Palace when we did the seminar and he was a very compassionate person. So uh, the one that he's portrayed as today is not, is not one that I recognise at all, not from, the, not from the early 90s. And, and lastly, when you look at the news, um, are you using your skills to analyse what is said, no matter from, from which side it comes? And what's your conclusion? Well, it's hard not to do that. It's a bit like I was at a dental a dentist con a conference last week and during the, the champagne and the talking, I was conscious they were all looking into my mouth saying, I could fix that, upper left occlusal, I could change that. Uh, so you're always on duty when you're doing this uh, wherever you are. So uh, I do that all the time. I avoid watching the news, particularly on, on the war, because uh, I was there during Crimea And I have a lot of close friends in, in Russia and a lot of close friends in the Ukraine. And uh, I saw what was reported and what the media was, and it wasn't, it just wasn't true. I left Crimea feeling very disappointed about what I'd seen reported and what was happening because I knew it wasn't true. So when I watch the media now, which is very rare, I, I, I get the summary on my, on my news on the computer every day. I, I look at it all with a skeptical eye because I know how, where the West Has, has a way of vilifying Russians and Islam and, and other, other such things. Uh, I think the West has, is guilty of doing a similar thing. I'm fully with you. <laughs> 